Hey everybody, I'm Maldonado and it's Wednesday and welcome to Real Talk on Real Estate. Um, we are, I have, I have something really um, exciting to uh, talk to you guys about today and it's um, the worst mistakes that I've ever made uh, building houses and they're not the mistakes that you think, okay? So it doesn't matter who you are. If you're watching this video, it's because it caught your interest because you want to find out what mistakes not to make. And I'm not talking about, oh, we set the tile wrong or we built a wall in the wrong spot or we put a cabinet in the wrong spot. And one time we actually put a wall for the uh, kitchen into the uh, into the uh, breakfast nook, literally in the wrong spot. And it compromised us on the house. But that's not the worst mistake that we've ever made building houses. Um, all of that construction stuff, that stuff is part of the game. Um, you're going to make those mistakes. The worst mistakes that we've ever made have to do with something entirely different. So if you are a homeowner, and you're wanting to build your own house, just one house, just your own personal home, you need to listen to this. If you're buying land, you're building houses, then you need to listen to this. If you're a real estate construction, home builder, badass, and you've done even 100 builds, you need to listen to this. Um, because these are the five biggest mistakes that we've ever made throughout our 25 plus year career in buying land and building houses. And I want to share them with you today. Um, so look, uh, my name is Jerome Maldonado. For those of you guys who don't know me, uh, don't know my story. I started out in construction in 1998. Didn't know anything about it. Um, I was in network marketing. And for my network marketing, I rode a roller coaster. Big, big ups, big downs. Um, we did, we became very, we, I, I became very unsuccessful in the beginning. Drove myself into debt. Very successful in the industry. One of the industry leaders. Um, so I'm proud to say that. Took me going way broke for many years to figure it out. And in the mid 90s, I figured it out. I made some money. And then the FTC shut us down in 1997 and I was broke again, lost everything. 1998, I decided to get into construction on accident. And when I did, um, I, I created a concrete company and I didn't know nothing about construction, but I was a hell of a marketer, really good at sales. And I was able to go sell projects. And I found other people that were better than me to go out and do the work, the labor in the field. And so I put a business together, a business model together that worked. And so from that, I was able to build a seven-figure business in my first year in 1998, going into 1999, and we scaled it since then. By 1999, I started taking that capital, investing it in real estate because I didn't want to go out and lose my ass again in the business world. I didn't want to go out there and build a business and then not have anything. And I knew that if I had real estate, I had an asset, and I didn't know nothing about real estate at that time, nothing at all. Didn't know how to build a house, had never done it. And so... I uh, sat down with my dad, who was an accountant, very analytical. We built an Excel spreadsheet, went to the process of building a house, step by step, took uh, two evenings to do it. Uh, one evening, we really did it. The next evening, we cleaned it up, fixed it. And um, and then I went to work on figuring out the process of how to buy land, build houses. That was 1999. Um, so here we sit, 2022, hundreds upon hundreds of acquisitions later, from residential to commercial developments. And one of the biggest mistakes that I ever made in the beginning is I was trying to make as much money as humanly possible. And in doing so, the number one mistake I made is I compromised the quality of what I did in my builds to maximize my profits. Now, when the market is stimulated, the market is like it is today, you can get away with that stuff, but that doesn't make you an incredible builder. That doesn't make you an industry guru. In fact, it makes you an idiot. And that's why, because I was the idiot. So I see this a lot. I go into builds because we own the real estate company. I have access um, with, the multi, with the MLS and my little Supra key on my phone. I can go into any property I want that's on our multiple listings and go look at those houses. I can go look at the outside. I can go look at the inside. I can go look at my competitor's products and say, you know what? They're doing that. That's incredible. I'm going to do that on my next build and I'm going to do it better. I can also go in there and go, this is a piece of shit. This is junk. I'm not going to go in there and do this because when my house goes up for sale next to this piece of garbage in a compressed market, I'm going to beat them. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to sell mine because mine is better. I'm going to learn from their garbage and I'm going to do better. And so I would see them going in in the beginning. I didn't do that. So in the beginning, I would go in and I would see boxes from Home Depot of Glacier Bay toilets. Nothing against Glacier Bay. You know, they sell a good product too, but there's a place for them. And it's not in a custom home that's half a million dollars plus. It's in my office buildings, for sake of example, or in a fix and flip that's $350,000, but not in our business model. And so the biggest mistake I made is I was going out and buying 
garbage from Home Depot. And then not that, gar not that, sorry, Home Depot, not that you're selling garbage, not at all. It's just that I was buying the most inexpensive stuff I can find off the retail shelves, off the retail shelves. So it doesn't matter if it's Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart, Costco, it doesn't matter. I was just buying a lower inferior product. And here's why, because it was a seller's market. There was no inventory pre-2008 on the market. Look, sound familiar to today? Well, ladies and gentlemen, when I was able to get away with that all the way up to 2008, we were able to go in by these little cheesy bald light fixtures and cheap toilets. And um, I was even putting Flamica tops in my in my uh, in my custom builds, what I was calling custom builds at that time. And then I, I scaled it up to two uh, CM granite countertops. And then we went to three CM and we scaled up from there. Right. But there was a time and place that we were going in using subpar materials. And when we did that and the market compressed, guess whose house is sat on the market? Mine. My house is on the market. Why? Because they could go in and they could get a better quality product from somebody else at the exact same price or maybe slightly margin, a slight margin higher. And, and they knew that because the market had compressed. And so our market will compress at some point in time. So you can go in today and you can go um, use subpar materials, cheap products, and you can get away with it because there's not enough inventory in the market. And people say, well, looks like a nice house. I guess I'll change out the light fixtures and, and the, maybe the hardware on my, on my sinks. Um, after I move in and then they land up never doing it because they just get busy with life. Right. And they land up with a subpar product and a bunch of garbage in their house. Well, people are sophisticated, especially buyers that are buying new homes in a market where prices are inflated. And so when you go back in and you start using quality products, it will help sell your homes. And so one of the biggest mistakes I made is by utilizing cheap products. Met a gentleman named Bob. Uh, Bob and I became good friends. We were flipping commercial buildings together way back when. And I remember sitting back with Bob and Bob would sit with, I remember doing this little tiny commercial building, nothing extravagant, but I remember Bob sitting back and he goes, Jerome, you take care of the construction. I'll take care of selling the property. I said, you got a deal. And so he goes, you build it right. You build it quality. I'll sell the thing. And this was post 2008. This is like 2009, 2010, 2011. The market still wasn't great at that time. But Bob came to me and he said, Jerome, I want you to go pick out some floors. I went and looked at some floors. I went and picked out some um, some nice um, compressed lumber wood floors that were about three bucks a square foot, two dollars and ninety eight cents, somewhere thereabouts, right? And I brought it to him. Said, "This is the wood floors we're going to use." And then he didn't say nothing. Came back the next day with like three, two or three samples. Every one of the samples he brought back was like over five dollars a square foot for the wood plank floors. And I'm sitting back scratching my head, going, "Bob, this is the most expensive shit on the shelves." He's like, I go, are you sure you want to use this stuff? I, I think we should use this stuff. You're not going to be able to tell the difference. It goes drone quality. Then we re-roofed the roof of that building. And he told me I, I was going in and I was going to re-roof it. And I was putting this little cheesy insulation on the top. And we had taken all the, all the insulation out of the inside of the building. And we took all the um, insulation out so that we can use exposed trusses, painted it, matted back, look real sleek, you know, like a lot of the modern builds that happen now in commercial buildings. You guys have all been into them in restaurants, nightclubs, office buildings where they're exposed trusses, painted black, everything is up there. And it looks nice. It looks sleek. It looks nice and attractive. It looks, it fits that more modern style, right? Well, we had done that on these buildings and then we weren't going to put insulation on there except for this little cheesy foam. And he goes, Jerome, what's the R rating on that? And I told him, I didn't know. So I told him, I don't know, Bob, but it's insulated, right? So we'll say it's insulated. And he goes, no, Jerome, let's get something that's correct. And so we went in with a two inch thick um, padded foam insulation that gave us like an R30 um, value on there. And so we insulated it correctly. And then we insulated the walls correctly. And I was apprehensive again with that because of the expense. And so we did it. And I said, all right, Bob, I'm going to do this. In spite of my better judgment, I'm going to do it. Are you sure we can get this back out of the building? Okay. Now, hence, this was an $80,000 building that we bought that we needed to sell for over, for close to $200,000 to make it work and $50,000 worth of renovations. Okay. So this went on through the entire project. At the end of it, he went to a, a group of his investors and he told them, look, this building is investor friendly. It's move in ready. You won't have to do anything to this building for 20 years. We sold that building in 30 days in a compressed market because of because of the fact that an investor had to do zero to it. They can roll in, they can lease the property, and they can get an end user in it um, right away. We ended up putting a beauty salon in there and, and, and something else, and it sold for top dollar. I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. And so I, at the time, I was doing the exact same things with my homes where I was going in and I was, I was utilizing um, better products. Not to, not to that magnitude, but better products than I was pre-recession. 
And I thought I was doing things right. And then I thought to myself, you know what? If this worked for these commercial buildings, and we did three of them together, Bob and I, and all three of them, exact same story, exact same story. I'm going to do this with my homes. And so we made changes that were minimal and just in, in, included better quality products that weren't cheap and inferior. And it sells our stuff. When we go into a compressed market, it'll sell your homes in, a, in an escalated market. It'll sell your house homes in a compressed market and it'll sell your homes no matter what your competitor is doing. So never use subpar products. That was mistake number one. Number two, um, I became very wasteful. This is very important. So number two, I became very wasteful. That was the second biggest mistake that I ever made. Um, so I was getting rich, right? I started building homes in 1999. We were we were knocking down six figures strong on every single house. And so I thought I'm independently wealthy and I got sloppy with stuff. And so I would go in and when I had 10 boxes of tile left over, I throw them in the back of a truck. Who God only knows where that stuff landed up. Employees probably took it home. It landed up in the back of a rollaway dumpster, um, getting hauled off with 30, 40 yards of trash. And everything went to the dumpster uh, because I didn't want to deal with it. I didn't have time. I was too rich. I was too um, affluent and wealthy to go out there and return product, right? Um, I was wasteful with labor. I'd have guys go out there and, and for four days instead of two days to go pour a driveway because I was so busy managing people. You know, we scaled too big. Um, we, we were too busy managing people that I was wasteful with labor. Um, when I got invoices from subs, instead of fighting with them or arguing with them or, or negotiating with them, I just pay them. I just write checks. And so instead of what I could make, maybe $170,000, $150,000 per bill, I was making $130,000 per bill. I was giving up $20,000 just from being wasteful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when the, when the market compressed in 2008, one of the biggest mistakes I'd made is I'd become so wasteful that I had money that I was just throwing away on nominal things that I could have fixed. And so one of the things I always tell people that are work with us in our circle, I say, look, manage your books, manage your materials and become less wasteful because you'll increase your profit margin by at least 5% if you do this correctly, right? So don't go, if you overorder products, I do it all the time. I don't underorder because underordering products is as bad as overordering products. And here's why, because when you don't have enough material on site, then you lose labor and labor is more expensive than materials. And so what I learned over the course of time is that I never go out and underbuy. So I always overpurchase, but then I always get the extra material and I take it back and return it. And then I just used some uh, floor and decor gift card or um, the, well, yeah, the other gift cards, but they were from returned items. And I had like $300 worth of retain, returned item gift cards that I just used to purchase uh, exterior Vasat tile for one of our bills. And it's 300 bucks, but 300 bucks times um, times 20 different trades or materials is a lot of money, right? That's $6,000. That goes down to your bottom line. Now, how many of you guys would throw $6,000 in a trash can? Any of you? Because I wouldn't, right? Like $6,000, I can do a lot with $6,000. That's a nice vacation, an incredible ski trip. Um, that's a nice piece of equipment. That's payroll for, you know, a few employees uh, for a week. You know, it's a lot of things. $6,000 a lot of money. And for most people that are just getting by, just making a living, $6,000 is life-changing. So it's the difference between you maybe making $80,000 and $86,000 on a build. You know, and so we got wasteful and we were doing that times 10, right? So if you got wasteful, it's six, seven to 8,000, even $10,000 worth of waste on every single home. Multiply that times 10, you're giving away six figures, $100,000 in what we call trash can money now, where it's money that you just throw in the trash because you become wasteful with materials, labor and everything else. So now we manage that stuff. We started managing that stuff a little bit harder after the recession in 2008. And we've never taken our foot off the pedal with that stuff. At the end of every build, we compile everything. We, put, we take everything that we don't need anymore back. When there's extra lumbers, beams, we have our guys separated. Trash goes in the dumpster, anything over a certain footage. And then anything that's been untouched, we pile it. We call the lumber company. They pick it up. They give it as a credit back. Now, in a day and age where lumber is your most appreciated material on your job site, are you guys going to let your framers cut that stuff up and make birdhouses out of it and throw it there and just kick it and stuff? No. So what we do now is anything over five feet long, we section it off, we put it in one pile. All the trash that's under five feet tall, under five feet long, goes in a, in a trash dumpster. Everything that's over, that's full length, hasn't been touched, goes back and gets returned. Anything over five feet and it's full sheets, we take it back to our yard and we recycle it for concrete material for forms and so forth. Now, some of you guys don't have concrete companies like we do. So you can just either 
um, utilize that or you can throw that stuff away. But make sure you never throw away the material you need to return because that can be a thousand dollar credit. We'll always get like fifteen hundred dollars in credit on just lumber alone at the end of every single bill. Now, with lumber prices the way they are, I bet you our credits will be closer to about two thousand or better um, just based off of uh, scrap lumber. Not even scrap lumber, but just leftover lumber at the end. Two by fours, two by sixes, warped material that never got utilized because it was garbage that we'll return. Sheets of, uh, of plywood, sheets of thermal ply. Um, and just stuff, right? Just stuff that's left over. We'll return all that stuff. So the second biggest mistake I ever made is becoming wasteful when, when the market was just so abundant. And then when the market became compressed, um, it, it hurt us, right? We were throwing money away and it hurt. It can hurt you anyways, because don't you want that profit back in your pocket? Nonetheless, I mean, I do. And so that was the second biggest mistake we made. Now, the third biggest mistake we ever made is um, purchased a uh, subpar lots. Um, you know, your land, those of you guys who are not just built, buying one piece of land, but you're buying land and building multiple houses over the course of time or desire to do that, uh, pay attention to this because I just went over this the other day. And I believe it or not, as smart as you might think that you become when you have success, right? Like I thought I was a genius. I thought, wow, the more money you make, the statement, the more money you make, the more money you make is that that was the way I thought. I was like, wow, it's true. The more money you make, the more money you continue to make, right? And I felt like that when two, pre-2008. And right now, I know for certain that there's people out there going, I'm a badass. I made, I got wealthy in crypto. I'm a badass. I'm a great entrepreneur. I know how to go out there and scale businesses. I am a badass. Let me tell you something. If you haven't been doing this for 15, 20 years and you have don't have 20, 30 builds on it under your belt, you're not a badass. I'll tell you, you're normal, you're human, and you're going to make mistakes. And one of the mistakes I made is that I thought there was a shortage of land. And so I was buying land in abundance. I was going out there and just buying everything I could get my hands on for the simple fact that I thought that we were truly going to run out of land. Ha, 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 right? Like laugh at me now, right? Uh, we're going to run out of land on earth. And I really felt that way. I felt like good quality, buildable lots, we were going to run out of them. Like there was there was a, there was an amount that, that was there and they, we were going to run out of all of them. And I was, I was, I felt like if I didn't buy them, I was going to be inferior in the market. So I was just buying lots and I didn't even care what they, I care what they look like, but I was buying by drainage canals or I was buying with no view of a mountain or no view of the lake or no, you know, whatever sold in that section of, of land, I was buying subpar lots compared to my competitors. And so when the market, and I was, oh, here's a big one. I was buying lots behind major roads, major highways. And so I, they were in nice subdivisions. It just happened I get a better deal. I just got a better deal on this lot because I backed it. To, it was the lot that sit on the busy road. And in a, in a, in a non-compressed seller's market, doesn't matter. You'll sell that inventory. But when the market gets compressed, guess what people will not buy? Because there's plenty of inventory when the market gets compressed. People aren't buying homes. They're in foreclosure. They go in and they buy what they want. They will search for what they want and they will find it because there's enough on the market. The thing is right now is there is not enough inventory in the market. So people will buy anything. They'll buy it back in a big major road with a bunch of semi truck no noise, Jake brakes being pulled on semi trucks, horn, 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 horns and stuff um, being blown. And look, if you're not in New York city and that's, and you're not in a big city, don't buy lots back in large roads unless you have a buffer from them, you know? And the reason why is you will have, an issue selling those houses, selling those lots after a after the compressed market happens. And if you're lucky enough to sell it before you compress in the market, awesome. But why take the risk? Why take the risk is what I always tell people. Just buy good quality lots and then you don't have to worry about it. And don't ever feel like you're gonna there's going to be a shortage of land. If you're out there and you're looking, you feel there's a shortage of land, you can't find what you're looking for, it's because you're not working with us. And even the people that are working with us, sometimes they come back and go, I can't find nothing. And I go, are you under a rock? There's plenty of land out there, I promise. You're just looking in the wrong places. And so I just re-steer them, redirect them, and get them looking for the right land that's not going to have compromising issues. Um, I say no to more pieces of land than I say yes to. The people that work with us in our inner circle and on how to buy land, build houses, I tell them, I, I make them say no to more land than they say yes to. But when they find land, even if it takes them 30 days or longer to find it, it's a home run. Because then we can move forward with that land and then they can be successful. And even in a compressed market, we can feel confident that we have a product that's superior to people that are buying sub, subpar lots in bad areas or have compromising factors that are beyond their control. 
once they build that house. Because once you're in it, you're in it. Once that house is up, you're committed, right? So let me tell you something. If you go to dance with, a, with a, your future wife or future husband and there's some stuff you just don't like, don't put that ring on that finger unless you know that that person, you can, you can live with those flaws. And that's what I was always told. Don't put putting rings on fingers that you can't, that you don't know if you can live with those flaws, right? So same thing. Don't, don't be putting a ring on the finger of that land. Don't be committing to a house bill worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you yourself know that there's flaws with that land, because if you see the flaw, guess who else is going to see the flaw? Your home buyers, I promise. And they will be the first ones to point it out. And realtors will do the same because realtors aren't in business to sell homes. Realtors are in business to find problems and not sell homes because most real residential realtors find more problems and create more havoc for home buyers. And I always say this, residential realtors, sorry if you're a good one because there are some good ones out there. But the mass majority of them suck. And so if you're most residential realtors, kill deals. Most realtors are deal killers. They go out there. They will be the first to point out every problem in your house to your home buyer. And even if the house is an incredible home, they'll find something wrong with your house. I promise to not sell your home. And they'll go out there and beat their head against a concrete wall for two, three months to go make a $10,000 commission when they could have made that extremely quickly, a, a lot easier in a nice quality home if you would have just built it correctly with your home. So FYI. So that's the third biggest mistake I've ever made is I got, uh, I, I bought subpar lots. Okay. So I always buy good lots. Don't, don't worry. I'd rather spend 10, 15 to $20,000 extra for a good lot that I know I can sell the property than a subpar lot that I can't get rid of. Okay. Now, number four, I, um, I, I didn't scale my business correctly. Now, this doesn't hold true for people that are just building one house. They're an end user. So if you're watching this video, this one step is the only step that isn't for you because you're watching this video to find out what did Jerome do wrong so that I can go out and be successful building my single family home. Now, if you're somebody who wants to buy land, build houses and continue doing it residually, multiples of them, listen here. I get this a lot. A lot of people come in to work with us in our inner circle and they sit back and go, Jerome, I'm building five, six homes right now. I want to scale it to 100 homes a year. And I go, are you sure you want to do that? I'll look them dead straight in the eyes. Are you sure you want to do that? And they go, yes. And I go, why? And they go, because I want to make more money. And I said, you're not going to make more money. So I don't know why you want to do that. And then they sit back and go, what do you mean I'm not going to make more money? I'm going to make more money if I, if I scale to 100. And I said, no, you won't. I promise you won't. And here's why. I was a multi-unit owner in Subway, had a ton of stores. I, I built tons of hundreds of homes, not on a yearly basis, but we built over 50 homes a year um, in our biggest. We were building, like, I think our biggest year was like 58 homes in one year. And, um, and we scaled it, right? And so I had, I had employees and I had staff and I had expenses and I had work trucks and I had tools and I had equipment. And I had one other thing, attrition rate, attrition rate of labor. I had an attrition rate of hours that happened. And so as we scaled, what happened is now I had to feed the dirty horse, right? I had to feed that horse and the ho that horse gets fed money. And that horse being your staff, your employees, right? And so once you scale, my question to you is how do you scale back once it gets out of your control? And what I mean by it getting out of your control is once it gets to a point when you're, you're still netting $2 million dollars building 50 homes and you were netting $2 million building out 15 homes. Why would you scale from 15 to 50 if you're netting out the exact same amount of money? Ego? I don't know. I did it. I thought I was going to make more money. Life lesson learned. Okay. So a lot of wasted labor, a lot of management hours trying to uh, manage um, payroll. And it's either a heart attack or sanity, a heart attack or sanity. OK, so you pick sanity over a heart attack. Why? Because you don't want to die building homes. Right. So sanity wins over heart attack. And the way you get sanity is by letting shit go a little bit. Right. By sitting back going, whoo, this beast is big. I'm willing to just pay the labor because I don't know what to do. You know, and, you know, it just doesn't just like calculate in your brain. Right. You just you're just working like a machine to keep up with the labor. And, and there's. There's factors, right? Like there's times you're waiting for permits and homes aren't coming out of the ground and you're forking out payroll, right? So there's there's an attrition rate to money that just keeps going out, right? And there's a, a point of diminishing return where money's just going out on payroll. And then all of a sudden you get a, a, a sale, a sale, a sale. And then you're like, whoo, I got $3 million back in the bank. And then you go, okay, then boom, 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 boom. Payroll's just flying out, right? And you're still doing good. You're making a couple million dollars a year, but you were doing that with 15 homes. Why would you have to go to 50 to do the exact same thing you were doing with 15? Because you're servicing a beast now. 
And now my question to you is, how do you scale back? Because once you've created the B, scaling back is not as easy as it was scaling. Because now you've got to figure out how to lay off employees that have been loyal to you for the most part, maybe, right? Hopefully. And, um, and now, you, uh, now you have unemployment taxes. Maybe uh, you have angry employees that are uh, filing lawsuits against you. Who knows, right? But it's a pain in the ass. And you feel guilty. And you're trying to fuel this beast. And you feel like, if I could just get this beast, you're in denial, too. So you're going, if I could just fuel this beast enough to get through this, I know I can figure this out. So one year goes by, then two years, then three years, then four years. And it never, it never smooths out because it's outside of your control, right? So now you build a hierarchy. Now, there is a, a reason to go to scale. Now, if you're trying to build a publicly traded company or you're trying to build your company to sell it, and what you're really trying to build is not houses, but you're trying to build a company and you're trying to become what's called EB positive, which means that your profitability continues to grow over the course of time. Then you pay yourself a salary. Your profitability doesn't really matter as much as long as you're profitable. And you can just scale the company exponentially and smoothly and healthy over the course of time. Then as you scale it, you get to a point where you're happy and you say, hey, I'm doing $20 million a year in, in, uh, in home builds. I could sell this for $60 million. That's worth it. That's a reason to scale. But if you're scaling, now I'll tell you a lot easier way to scale. And without having to do that and build a business over the course of 15 years, you could do something in five years that instead of making worth 50 million, you could be worth 150 million or more by building multi-unit developments, multifamily, condo complexes, short-term rentals, uh, a, a, a portfolio of homes, or building out warehouse, industrial warehouse, stuff like that, where you go out and you buy land, build houses, you make maybe a million dollars a year, maybe you make a few hundred thousand dollars a year, do it for two, three years, save maybe half a million, a million dollars, go out and build yourself a $4 million building. Then you go out, do a cash refinance, you take advantage of all the tax benefits you're not going to get out of this video. That's for a whole other subject, whole other day. But then you scale that and you go out and you get, and you scale bigger. And then you have tax benefits that you can depreciate those assets, not pay any taxes on it like the wealthy. So all of you guys who hate wealthy people for not paying taxes, you're paying taxes. You're paying property taxes, sales taxes. You're paying employment taxes. You're just not paying individual income taxes because the government's rewarding you for being a badass and going out there and scaling business was what the government does. They're rewarding you for scaling a business the correct way and utilizing um, tax laws that are set in place so that you can go out there and continue scaling. Now you can learn all that and more, but just not in this video. This video was the worst mistakes ever made building houses. And I'll tell you that that mistake scaling too big was the worst mistake I ever made. The best, the best thing that ever happened to me in that regards, in that regards was the 2008 recession because I was forced to, um, to downscale. I, I didn't have a choice, right? Like the world compressed and I just, you know, things happen, right? Like it was outside of my control. I was vulnerable to it, but it was the best thing that happened in that regards for that decision. I was able to downscale my staff, clean up my mess, and then I never went out and built more than 10 homes a year after that. And we were still making over $1.5 million net on the side because building homes was always our side business. We did, we had our concrete business running full time and all our investments and other companies running full time. And so we'd always build 10 to 12 homes a year. And we'd always make over a million dollars a year net income because we had a six figure model on every build. And I was able to, to, to control that with one superintendent, myself, and one admin, three employees. You could make over a million dollars net income a year with three employees. Now that's pretty damn cool. So I don't care who you are and what you're watching. You can sit there and feed your garbage to somebody else. But I know that 97% of the people that are watching this video, that's life changing. How do I know that? Because over 60% of the people watching this video, $200 a month will make them go into bankruptcy just after three months if, they're, if their income changed by, three, by $200 a month. That's how over leveraged people are in America. You guys ever watch the debt clock and see our national debt just compiling in, in a factor that you can't even keep up with the time clock? It's just in millions of dollars just turning every single day. And you just sit back and go, oh, my God, this is crazy, right? Your eyes just go back and, and it's, it's an eye opener when you look at our debt clock and how much money people are, are living in debt with here in America and worldwide, but mostly here in America. And so I know that over 60 percent of people this is life changing for. And then for the other for another 35 percent of people that are living, living good, median lives, this is life changing for. Because if I can put six figures back in your pocket by teaching you how to do this, by just doing one build a year, 
you're going to kick ass. And you're going to be in the top one-tenth of 1% 1 of all money earners. It's a history of Adam and Eve. So pretty damn cool. Number five, fifth thing that I did when the mar um, worst thing I've ever done, um, the worst mistake that I've ever made building houses is, um, is not being insured properly. Okay. This is super important. And I leave this to, um, for last and definitely last but not least, one of the most important things. You're going to scale a business. You're going to land a buying land, building houses. Make sure that you get a liability policy and a builder's risk policy. They're different. They're different. Okay. So I'd go out and I had general liability insurance. I was trying to save a buck. And I'd say, oh, J. Jacob uh, Enterprises is just a management company. We just consult, right? We're a paper contractor. We don't have full-time employees other than an on-site superintendent and a, and a, um, and an admin. And really, we only insured the admin because the superintendent, we ran through our full-time construction company. So we did pay workman's comp on that. But here's what happens. We, we get a comp we get a, a, a savvy business, a savvy home buyer that's a pain in the ass. And um, they've sued people before. And they're wanting to go after our insurance companies because now you're the badass builder in your area and you're making money. And all of a sudden you build four or five, six houses in the same area, you're rich. And you just get that one bad buyer. And it happens. It'll happen to you. You build over the course of time. You'll get into a lawsuit. They're going to come after you, um, your insurance. And they're going to say you did something wrong. Even if you didn't, they're going to say you did. And you're going to have to fight a lawsuit. We've had to do three of them over the years. OK, and we've won all three of them. But at what expense? Um, I've spent in excess of a quarter million dollars fighting lawsuits that I won. Was it worth it? Well, yeah, it was worth it. But no, it's not worth it. Right. Like we try settling and settling for a big sum of money. And in early years, when I got into my first lawsuit, I had uh, I had my insurance set up all jacked up. So they covered a portion of it. But I had to land out of pocket spending a quarter million dollars in attorney's fees to protect myself. And uh, because they brought me personally into it, my, my, my construction company, my real estate company, the development company, four entities, plus the, the prior developer that developed that land. They, there was like seven of us labeled in the lawsuit. And we all won the lawsuit, but it took us two years of, of legal battles to deal this. Now, I'm not telling you guys this to scare you because I don't want to scare you at all. In fact, I'll tell you that I would go through all of it all over again and 10 times over um, doing what we've done. But the more you make, the more exposure you have. The more you make, the more liability you have. If you don't want exposure, go crawl under a rock. Don't make any money. Close yourself in a dark, hidden closet. But because if you go out, you make some money and you expose yourself, you're going to have some liability. Just know how to protect yourself. One of the biggest mistakes I ever made in building houses, I didn't have the right insurance. I was trying to save money on insurance because insurance um, premiums are expensive. But let me tell you what's more expensive than insurance. Litigation attorneys. Because attorneys, ladies and gentlemen, do not get paid to settle cases. They get paid to litigate. Okay. I'm going to say that again. Attorneys don't get paid to settle cases. I mean, yes, they do. The attorneys, they get paid to settle cases and make me win money. Boop. Wrong. They don't. Because if they settle the case, their income stops. They have to go find a new customer. So they want that lawsuit to go as long as they can make it go so they can continue litigating. So they have that income coming in over the course of a year or two. And so, ladies and gentlemen, why not make that the insurance company's problem, not yours? Go out and, and learn how to get an umbrella policy over your personal self. So if they bring you personally into a lawsuit, you're covered. You got an umbrella policy. You call your insurance company say, hey, I need, a, I need an attorney. If you don't like the attorney, you tell your insurance company, this attorney's a dipshit. I need a better attorney. They give you another one. And you'll do that two, three times sometimes to find the right attorney. But guess who's not paying for it? Me. My insurance company is. Then my real estate company that I did, and they're saying that we did stuff wrong and we misled them and didn't disclose stuff. Beep. Phone call. Mr. Insurance Man. J. J. Cabrility. Yep. I, I, have a, I have an issue. I need an attorney. Right? Get that bad boy working for you. Then you call the other insurance company. Yep. Our construction company. Yep. We need an attorney. Boop. Get that one working for you. Okay. And so knowing how to insure my properties correctly, I just, it's just, it's just the expense of doing business. So now someone hits us with a lawsuit. I make a phone call and I go do what Jerome does best. And that's make money developing and building. 
That's going out there and being a business owner. So I can focus on my staff, my employees, managing my company. So I don't have this little special project going on in the background that I'm having to feed financially and work to fund and feed. And, and most people, ladies and gentlemen, are making the capital that we made. So we, we're making millions of dollars every year. So for those people that are barely making mom and pop shops that are barely making money, which is most people out there. But how do I know? Because I own retail centers. I have a ton of mom and pop people that rent from me. I know they barely make it because they struggle paying us rent. So that takes businesses out of business. That'll put you under a rock. That will put you out of business so fast it'll make your head spin. And so for those of you guys who sit back, well, I'm going to sue you. I'm going to go ahead. Anything we can do to mitigate risk and liability, we do. Anything we can do, it's a business. Even if they're 100% wrong, we're 100% right, I will write I will write them a check to get out of that stuff. So that doesn't mean, well, I'm going to go sue Jerome and write them a check. No, it doesn't matter. Look, we will soak you dry. And then we'll do it at the end. And what my attorney said, just let's bloody them up. And then once they're bloodied up and they know the reality, that they're not really getting any money, if they're soaked underneath the ground and they can't get out of it and they realize their attorney just took them for a wild horse ride. You guys want to be bull riders? Go do a litigation because it doesn't matter which side you're on. Your ass is going to get drugged through the dirt. OK, financially. So my attorney will say, let's go bloody them up, Jerome. And then once they're bloodied up, we'll settle with them. And then they settle for less than they spent in attorney's fees nine times out of 10. Okay. So understand if that's the worst mistake, one of the, the fifth and one of the worst mistakes I've ever made is not being insured correctly. So ladies and gentlemen, we're insured correctly, but we will bloody, bloody people up that come after us because it becomes war and it becomes personal. And then once they're bloodied up, we settle if the insurance companies pay for it. So ladies and gentlemen, if that information isn't worth a million dollars right there, then don't give us a thumbs up. But if it's worth a million dollars to you like it is to us, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to our YouTube channel so you get more notifications when good information just like this gets released. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you like the content today, you're going to want to see our How to Buy Land, Build Houses video. Um, I'm doing a full series of it. And so you get, I'm going to put in this video once we once it's uploaded, you, if you're watching this on repeat, it's going to be um, someplace either right here, right here, or down below. There's going to be a link for you to click and watch of series number one on how to buy land, build houses. Um, I'm, I bought a piece of land. It's for you guys. I'm going to teach you guys how to buy land, build houses, and I'm going to teach you through the entire process. I'm not going to just teach it to you all over the place. Like, hey, we're buying a piece of land today. Hey, we're putting a roof on the house today. No, we're going to teach you how to go in, buy the piece of land. We're going to teach you guys how to get the, the get the architect work done. We're going to teach you guys about how to grade the land, how to hire your subcontractors, how to get HOA approval, the whole process. And so if you haven't already seen the entire, the entire program, we already have four series as of the time this video airs and it's going to continue because people are going to continue watching this video. We'll probably have more and more and more by then. And we already have four series. Click below, watch video no series number one, Follow the series all the way through and through and learn how you can go out, make six figures, buying land, building houses on every build you do to follow our business model. Click below, join us on, on more YouTube content and watch our first series. We'll see you on the other side. You guys go out, make it a great day. God bless. And thank you guys for watching.